Hello and thank you for joining me. Today we are going to read People of the Deer by Farley Moat. Um, I want to apologise in advance if I mispronounce any names of locations or people in this book. I've never read it before, I have no idea what this book's about, um, but I am interested in uh, the culture and life of different peoples across the world and especially about um, early exploration and travel and uh, yeah I think this book will probably encompass a lot of that so yes if you are ready to join me on this journey also uh, as this is the first book I have ever read and um, will be putting it into a video I might stumble sometimes and um, yeah so forgive me for that but um, I want to just push forward and gain confidence and then um, yeah we'll take it from there and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it and yeah also if there's any words that I don't recognize or understand fully I do like to write them on a notepad which will be beside me and if you want to stay till the end of the video We'll go through some of the words that I don't really recognise and we'll go through a dictionary and just read their definitions and yeah so you can always uh, come and join me with that as well and um, yeah so let's just see how we get on and uh, just get stuck into the story. So people of the deer. Four word. On an evening, when the sun hovered above the horizon's lip, I sat beside a man who was not of my race, and watched a spectacle so overwhelming in its magnitude that I had no words for it. Below us, on the undulating darkness of the barren plains, a tide of life flowed out of the dim south and engulfed the world, submerged it so that it sank beneath a living sea. The very air was heavy with the breath of life itself. There was a sound of breathing and of moving that was like a writhing wind. It was as if the inanimate and brutal crust of rock had been imbued with the essential spark and had risen from its age ageless rigidity to claim the rights of life. The man who sat beside me stared over the rolling hordes that swept in upon us and it was as if he stretched the hands of his soul out to the flood, the eddying, turbulent, and all-embracing flood. I felt afraid. The man beside me was no longer there. In some way that I could not fathom, he had gone from me and had flung himself into that living torrent. There was an ecstasy upon him then. The man was gone. His spirit had sought and found a union with the amorphous, living entity which had possessed this land so i'm just going to write that down sorry amorphous amorphous i could not understand for i was a stranger in that place but the man who had been beside me was of the land he was more than that he was of this profound, incredible thing that I was beholding. Darkness was full upon us before the man returned to me. There was no light left upon the plains, but the unseen shadows still held the faint murmur of ten thousand vital hearts beating with strength and power on every side of us. It was too dark to see, and yet I knew the man had turned his face toward me, fixed his eyes on mine, he spoke so quietly it might have been that I heard words spoken from the divided voice of the monstrous visitation I had witnessed. Took to me, the words came slowly, this is the host, the legion of the deer. Okay, so I think this is the first chapter. Chapter 1, The Why and the Wherefore. In the spring of 1935, when I was an undersized youth of 15, I made my first journey into Arctic lands, under the tutelage of a great uncle who was an amateur but fanatical student of birds. 
My Uncle Frank's consuming interest in wild things had been perpetuated in me, for from the age of six I too had been passionately interested in all the animals that haunted the rolling prairies near my home in Saskatoon. Our house in that western city had for long years been shared with pet skunks, queer coyotes, crows, gophers and rattlesnakes of uncertain disposition. Even my human friends were chosen almost exclusively from the half-wild and suitably ragged children at the Dundurn Indian Reserve, for I shared with those sons of nomads a strange devotion to the illusory freedom of the broad prairie plains. That restless longing to find an affinity with primordial things was a legacy from my father, but it took shape and gained direction under the influence of great uncle Frank. He, at my, at my mother's request, undertook to take me with him on one of his yearly pilgrimage, pilgrimages to the ancient tundras of the, of the Arctic, where we where we were to spend a summer among the curious northern birds whose very names were a mystery in my ears and whose way of li ways of life were old before ours were begun. In the first week of May 1935, the meadow larks brought spring to Saskatoon and Uncle Frank was close behind. Tall, gaunt and weather-worn, he was still filled with the indestructible energy which had carried him through arduous years of struggle with the tough sod of an Alberta wheat farm. He had acquitted himself well in that long battle against hail and blight, and now in his late sixties he was able to indulge his lifelong hobby, and so each new spring saw him voyaging to some distant place to watch birds whose lives he longed to know and understand. To my young eyes, Uncle Frank was somewhat dusty, Olympian, and beside him I felt as insignificant as a blade of twitch grass. Yet when he looked down upon me from his great spare height, he seemed to be vaguely satisfied with what he saw, and so, on the day following his arrival at Saskatoon, we too set off together for Winnipeg, the central gateway to the Arctic lands. It was the beginning of an odyssey. From Winnipeg, the railroad sweeps westward in a wild curve over the flat, rich wheatlands, which are the bed of ancient Lake Agassiz, a mighty lake that died with the last glacier. Then the steel bends northward, northward, and in time the train passes the flat farmlands, and little villages go by, each marked by the bulge of an orthodox steeple and the square monument of a grain elevator. Slowly the forests extend their rough fingers into black soil on f of the farms, until the fingers close tightly. The prairies are gone, and only the matted disorder of forests remain. The train runs more cautiously now, for it is entering a land that is hostile to strangers, it makes its way northward through the low forests which are the home of the Cree Indians, and at last it draws up with gusty relief at the frontier town of the Paz. Here, in a decaying cluster of buildings, the Winnipeg train turns gratefully back to the south and hurries to leave behind and hurries to leave behind it the anonymous tangle of forests and muskeg. But the Pars, that seedy settlement which has been left behind to wither and rot as the frontier has pushed north, is not yet the end of the steel. Instead, it is the southern terminus for a cockeyed political shenanigan that is proudly known in Canada's capital as the Hudson Bay Railway, but it is better known in the land where it lives as the Muskeg Express rebellious and contrary railway that may have an equal in the wilds of Siberia. The Muskeg Express has no relatives on this continent. It stretches northward for 500 desolate miles to the shore of Hudson Bay. It thinks nothing of running a hundred miles at a time without curves and without bends to relieve the heavy-footed pace it maintains. 
For the most part, its road bed is built upon blocks of ancient peat moss, and this moss in turn sits uneasily on the perpetual ice of the muskegs and swamps, whose black depths hold the last dominions of the old vanished glaciers. The only passenger accommodation on the train was in the caboose, so Uncle Frank and I lived there for three days and two nights that the journey consumed. I amused myself by keeping track of the little white painted signboards, signboards, signboards which mark off each mile, and by counting the number of rail spikes per mile that flew out of the tyres and went buzzing off through the air like bullets as the train passed along. I was grateful to the mile boards and to the spikes for the monotony of that northward journey through the unchanging and sombre forests was almost unbroken by anything else. But at mile 410, something did happen. Something that was to me, something that was to lead me to, into an undreamed of world in the years which still lay far ahead. Near mile 400, I had noticed that the maddening succession of stunted and half drowned spruce trees was beginning to be pierced by long, finger like openings running down from the northwest. When I pointed them out to my uncle Frank, he explained that these were the slim tentacles which were being thrust southward by those great arctic plains we call the barrens, and the presence of these fingers of the plains marked the passing down, passing of the dominion of forest. I climbed up to the high bench of the caboose cupola, cupola. Hmm. what is a cupola? Let's write it down, cupola. I climbed up to the high bench of the caboose cupola to have a better look at the new lands which were appearing, and I was there when the marker for mile 410 came into view, and simultaneously the rusty whistle of the old engine began to give tongue. It was to continue sounding for a full half hour, with a reckless disregard for steam pressure, but at the first blast I looked forward over the humped backs of the fright cars and noticed the whistle no more. A brown flowing river had appeared and was surging out of the edge of the dying forests and plunging across and over the snow-covered roadbed ahead. A broad turbulent ribbon of brown ran out of an opening to the southeast and traced its sinuous course northwest over the snows of a land that was still completely gripped by the frosts, for this was no river of water, but a river of life. I had my binoculars to my eyes in the instant, and through the lenses I saw the stream dissolve into a, its myriad parts, and each part of that river was the long-legged shape of a deer. Kes Kes la faule, obviously it's French. Kes or c'est la faule. The French Canadian brakesman stood beside me, and at the sound of his words, I understood what it was that he I was beholding. It is the throng. Those were the words that the first of the early French explorers wrote in his journal when he beheld what is perhaps the most tremendous living spectacle that our continent knows, the almost incredible mass migration of the numberless herds of caribou, the reindeer of the Canadian North. The train whistle continued to blow with infu increasing fury and exasperation, but the rolling hordes of the caribou did not deviate from their own right of way, which took precedence over man's. They did not hurry their steady lope, and as we drew up to them, the engine gave up its futile efforts to intimidate the throng, and with a resigned whiffle of steam we came to a halt. It was a long halt, for the next hour we stayed there, and for, and for an hour the half-mile-wide river of Caribou flowed unhurriedly north in a phenomenal procession so overwhelming in its magnitude that I could hardly credit my senses. 
Then abruptly the river thinned out and in a few moments was gone, leaving behind it a broad highway beaten to the snow. The old train gathered its waning strength. The passengers who had alighted to brew up some tea climbed aboard and we too continued into the north. The stunted trees closed in again and the white mile boards flickered past as if the sight of the throng had been only an illusion in time and space. But it was no illusion, for every detail of that sight remains with me now, with a clarity that does not belong to illusion. It was a sight that a boy or a man does not forget, and the sight I beheld at mile 410 was many years later to draw me inexplorably back to the land of Le Fowl. In its own good time, the Muskeg Express brought us out of the forest and within sight of the ice-filled waters of Hudson Bay and to the end of a journey. I spent that summer at Churchill in a fly-haunted search for bird's eggs under the untiring direction of my uncle. The spectacle of Le Fowl faded to the back of my mind for on the sodden Muskegs there were too many strange birds calling the Hudsonian curlews with their haunting whistles, the godwits, and the snow buntings and longspurs. There was too much for me to see there on the south verges of the Arctic, and too much to hear. With the last summer days of 1935, I again climbed back aboard the Muskeg Special and left the tantalising borders of the bar barrens behind me for a decade. I returned home with a large box of bird's eggs, a tin can containing six live lemon mice and a crate holding a queer bird called a jaeger, a hunter, or jaeger, which looks like a gull and acts like a hawk. In addition to these things, I brought back many memories, both varied and vivid, yet as time passed, it was the memory of the great herd of caribou at mile 410 that emerged as the strongest of all, and that particular memory was kept alive and grew more powerful as I grew older because of an intangible longing that the Arctic had implanted so deeply in my heart that its fever could not be chilled even by the passing years. It is, I suppose, a sort of disease, an Arctic fever, and yet no microscope can discover its virus, and it remains completely unknown to the savants of science. The Arctic fever has no effect on the body, but lives only in the mind, filling its victim with consuming urge to wander again and forever through those mighty spaces where the caribou herds flow like living rivers over the roll of the tundra. It is the disease of the imagination, and yet it attacks men whom you would not normally accuse of being imaginative. It is the unknown. Uh, it is this unknown disease that drives. Tactitern, ta taciturn, another word, T-A-C-I-T-U-R-N, that drives taciturn white men back to their crude long shanties year after year, back to the desperate life of the intermin interminable winter night and back to the wind and the search through the grey snow for the white fox and the ermine. Another one, sorry. Ermine. The disease is one of the... The disease is one of great power indeed, for it does not leave such victims as these until life itself leaves them. The infection lay dormant in me for many years. From 1935 until 1939, my life held so many things that the call of the bleak lands to the north was never strong enough to take command of my will. During those years, I went on with my schooling, spending my holidays on the prairies in the mountains to the west and the forest to the east, but never completely forgetting the stark plains to the north. In those years I was particularly engrossed in the study of birds and mammals, for I had decided that I would become a zoologist and spend my life at that study. 
But then, when I was 19 years old, I had to exchange my old shotgun for a Lee Enfield rifle, for I became a soldier in the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment. I exchanged the prairies and mountains for the close for the close confines of an intran- of an infantry regiment, and the world that now lay outside those narrow bounds suddenly became a mad nightmare creation which I feared and could not understand. Nineteen forty one came, and I was part of the war in southern England, and on my briefs on um, and on my brief leaves I watched without comprehension as the walls of the great of great cities crumbled over the dismembered bodies of men. I began to know a sick and corroding fear that grew from an unresolved revolt against mankind. The one living thing that could deliberately bring down a world in senseless slaughter. The war drove inexorably on. My regiment moved through Italy, then up through France into Belgium and Holland, and at long last into the Reich. And one day there were no more crashes of shell fire in the air, and it was done. In the spring of 1946 I returned to my own land, but it was a far cry from my return to my house in 1935. I wished to escape into the quiet sanctuary where the echoes of war had never been heard, and to this end I at once arranged to become what is called a scientific collector, who would go into far places and bring back rare specimens for science to stare at, desperately seeking, excuse me, <coughs> desperately seeking for some stable thing rooted deep in reality. I grasped the opportunity to labour in what I thought was the austere pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. So it was that at the end of 1946 I found myself far up into the forests of northern Saska, Saska, Chuen, Saska Chuen, at a place called La La Ronge. Nominally, nominally, I was there to collect birds for a museum, but I had put my gun away, for I soon had enough of scientific destruction, even as I had enough of killing in the wartime. The search for tranquillity which had led me hopefully into the science into science had failed, for now I could see only a brutal futility in the senseless amassing of little bird mummies which were to be preserved from the ravages of life in dark rows of steel cabinets behind the stone wall. So I was simply living without any particular aim in a squalid settlement of Cree Indian half breeds and there among a people who were the dregs of a dying race that had been degraded and led to decay by all that is evil in civilised life, there I found a man who unwittingly gave me a direction and a new goal. From old Henry from old Henry Moberly, a half breed who had spent most of his years on the borders of the northernmost forests. I once again heard of the caribou that I had seen so many years before. Henry told me living tales of the deer, as the caribou are universally called in the land, so that I remembered La Fowle with startling clarity, and it was then that the quiescent and it was then that the quiescent again another word quiescent quiescent. Q U I S C E N T. Quiescent disease of the Arctic sprang to new life within me and began to possess me completely. With the picture of the deer held firmly in my mind as a spiritual talisman, I returned to the cities for the winter, and my heart was closer to knowing peace than it had been in six years. I went back to the university and took a zoological course which would fit me to become a student of the deer, for in those days the habitats and life of the caribou were a great mystery waiting to be solved, and I had decided that the pursuit of this mystery was to be my endeavour, perhaps not completely an honest endeavour, for even then I was dimly aware that the deer were to serve primarily as my excuse for a return to the north, which was calling to me. 
Nevertheless, I worked hard during the winter, and in my spare time I read every book about the Arctic that I could lay hands on. Until I began to have some, con until I began to have some conception of what lies behind that, un <sighs> until I began to have some conception of what lies behind that unrevealing world. As I read, I came to understand that the Ar as I read, I came to understand that the Arctic is not only a world of frozen rivers and icebound lakes, but also of living rivers and of lakes whose very blue depths are flanked by summer flowers and by sweeping green meadows. The Arctic not only knows the absolute cold of the pole, but it also knows days of overpowering heat when a naked man sweats with the simple exertion of walking. And most important of all, I came to understand that the Arctic is not only the ice-covered cap of the world, but it is also nearly two million square miles of rolling plains that during the heat of midsummer are thronged with life and brilliant with the colours of countless plants in full bloom. It was these immense plains which drew my special attention, and when I found them on a map of the continent, I saw that they formed a great triangle, with its narrow apex pointing west to the shore of the Arctic Ocean, not far from the mouth of the Mackenzie River and the Alaskan border. The triangle's base lies along the west shore of Hudson Bay, and its two arms extend westward, one along, t one along Timberline and the other along the coast of the Arctic Sea, and the name of this vast treeless land is the Barrens. I saw it in my mind's eye as a mighty land and a strange one. As geological time is reckoned, it emerged only yesterday from under the weight of the glaciers, and today it remains almost as it was when the ponderous mountains of ice finished grinding her way over its face. It is a la it is <coughs> it is a land of undulating plains that have no horizons, of low hills planed into a shapeless uniformity by the great power of the ice. It is a la it is a land of gravel, of sand, and of shattered grey rocks, but without soil as we know it. It is also a land that seems to be struggling to emerge from a freshwater ocean, for it is almost half water, holding countless numbers of lakes and their rivers, and this was the land where I would have to seek out the caribou, for it is their land. Toward the end of the winter, I met an old army friend, who in peacetime was a mincing engineer, and I told him something of my interest in the Arctic. He was a little amused at the idea of anyone's heading out into the, those lands when he might be reaping the value of five years' war, five years war exile from the rich post-war fabric of the boom. But he did me a favour, a much greater one than he knew. He gave me a stack of old government mining reports his father had owned, and he said that he thought some of them might deal with the North might deal with the north I wanted to know. He was right, for in that musty old pile of books I found my lodestone to the land of the deer. My lodestone. Lodestone. I've never heard that before. Lodestone. I found my lodestone to the land of the deer. I looked through the pile of pamphlets and books which he had given me, one of the dingiest of the lot bore the prosaic title Report on the Dubaunt, Kazan and Ferguson Rivers and the Northwest Coast of Hudson Bay. It had been published in 1896 and on the surface it, it appeared to be a dry as dust compilation of outdated facts written by some, written by some dull-eyed servant of government. But appearances were deceptive. I recognised the author's name, Joseph Burr Tyrell, and I remembered that in some obscure paper that I had read in that in um sorry, and I remembered that in some obscure paper that I had read, 
an old account of Tyrell's fantastic explorations through the central barren lands of Kiwantin. For Tyrell had been the first and the last man ever to traverse the full breadth of the barrens from south to north. I opened his report eagerly. It was not quite the usual run of his it was not quite the usual run of official documents. For though Tyrell had been devoted to his gods, mineralog mineral mineralogy and geography, he had written about them with an undertone of enthusiasm and excitement which did not seem to belong between those staid covers and government seals. There was a pungency about his writing writings that made even his endless comments on the minerals he had examined seem interesting and fresh, and yet in the Dubont report there was only room for brief hints about the true nature of the land and about the trials and troubles which had been which had beset Tyrell. Here and there I did come across scattered references to the deer, and in one place Tyrell spoke succinct 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 Neck. <laughs> Sorry, succinctly of seeing what may have been the greatest single herd ever to be seen by a white man, a herd so fast that for many miles the surface of the land was obscured beneath a blanket of living beasts. The mental image of this magnificent spectacle strengthened my desire to go to the barons, but I found one other thing hidden in Tyrell's report that finally confirmed my resolve, for Tyrell spoke of a people of the deer. Out in those endless spaces along the river he called Kazan, Tyrell found a race of men where it was thought that no men could live, and interwoven between his lists of rocks were fragmentary and tantalising references to these men who had remained completely cut off from the world's knowledge until the day of Tyrell's coming. In the, in the Dubon report, a shadow of this forgotten race emerged for the first time before our eyes, and it was clear enough that they were a people who, in Tyrell's day, had been living the same lives they had led before the Viking longboats first discovered the eastern shores of North America. Tyrell could spare them only a few terse and niggardly paragraphs, yet he, yet he said enough to make the baron's people seem a fa as fascinating as dwellers in another world. Obviously they were men whose total strength had been devoted to a bitter struggle against the implacable natural forces of the baron and the idea came to me that they might never have found the will or desire or the desire to turn their strength against one another. If this was indeed true, then it was certain they were a people I wanted to know. But half a century had intervened since Tyrell discovered this inland race of Eskimos, and it seemed inevitable that during that time great changes must have come to the land and to its inhabitants. I renewed my search for the of the literature of the Arctic in an effort to discover how much was known of the people and of the land which Tyrell had seen, and to my secret satisfaction I found no further word about Tyrell's people, though there were sufficient rumours and second-hand reports to convince me that those men of the deer still lived in their hidden world. I sent to Ottawa for the most recent maps of the Central Plains. When they arrived, I spread them out on the floor and studied them with mounting excitement, for they showed little more than the tenuous dotted outlines of those features which Tyrell had drawn half a century before. For the most part, the maps were unsullied white, defaced only by small printed legends reading unmapped. To the north of this clouded region, the coast of the continent was accurately shown and it was studded with the settlements of Eskimos who had been in contact with our race for better than a hundred years. To the east, along the shores of the Hudson Bay, the picture was the same. To the south lay the forests, and the old river routes of the voyagers who had explored the timberlands centuries earlier. 
and to the distant west lay the rich and busy valley of the Mackenzie, but in the middle of all these lay only emptiness, not only on the maps but in the books as well. There was a reason for this. When the first white men looked across the borders of this land, they named it the Barrens, and shuddered at its terrible rawness, and so they turned from it, never knowing that it held rivers of life in its depths. The existence of this barrier built upon an indefinable fear. The existence of this barrier built upon an indefinable fear was made known to me when I sought when I sought definite information about ways and means to enter the land. I went to the books, but again they were not of much but again they were not wouldn't it? but again they were not much of a help. I found that several men had indeed travelled in the boundary regions of the barons, and a few had even penetrated deeply into the narrow western neck of the plains, where they are where they are squeezed between timber line and the sea coast, yet all who yet all who had attempted to write of what they had found had evidently been seized by an inarticulate par paralysis when they tried to put their deepest impressions into their writings. They seemed to grope futilely for words with which they could express the emotions the baron the barons had instilled in their hearts and they were all baffled by that effort to speak clearly. Most of them gave up... Sorry, my mouth's getting dry. Most of them gave up the attempt and sought refuge in minute descriptions of the component parts, which only if they are taken in their entirety can give the true measure of the Arctic plains. It seems to me to be a great mystery this impenetrable obscurity that could not even be shattered by men who gave all their senses and their perceptions to the task. But on a day in the spring of 1947, when I had almost completed my own plans to set out for the north, I received the first real clue to the nature of that mystery. It was contained in a letter from a former Royal Canadian Mounted Police Constable whom I had known during the war. I had written, asking if they had any personal experience with the Arctic Plains, and his answer told me of a time when he had gone into the Western Barrens in pursuit of an Indian murderer. The murderer escaped, from the police at least, and my friend turned back just in time to save his own life, for he was starved and half-frozen before he reached the shelter of a coastal trading post. Writing to me, he summed up all the Barrens had meant to him, in these few straightforward words. I guess it was the emptiness that bothered me most, that damn and bloody space. It just goes on and on until it makes you want to cry or scream or cut your own damn throat. Emptiness and the terrible space, these were the things which had haunted the imaginations of the few white men who had known the barons. And yet somewhere in the hidden depths of that space there lived, if they still lived, not only the great herds of the deer, but also men, the people of the deer. And I will leave it there. So that is the first chapter of People of the Deer. And I think that's a great opening to a journey. And I am looking forward to see where this journey takes him and who he gets to meet. And uh, yeah, so... I will now go and have a look for these words that I wrote down. So I had amorphous capola, tact, tactitern or taciturn, ermine, quiescent, 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 and lodestone. So I'm going to look them up and then I will uh, finish the rest of the video with the definitions. And uh, yeah, so thank you for joining me and it was lovely to have a first read through and uh, just just do it. Um, so yeah, so that's chapter one and I will keep continuing the rest of the book and I will do chapter two on another day. So thank you and take care. Bye.